Hello friends, I am Dr. Urmi Satin and today we will talk about an American play, The Zoo Story by Edward Albee. Edward Albee is an American playwright. In his play, The Zoo Story, he shows the extent to which American society is shattered. No maxims with the sense of human relations like sharing is caring or a family that eats together, stays together can fill the multiple gaps and cracks within and among the members of this psychologically fractured society. The members of this society have lost the hope to live. They are like disconnected wanderers in search of nothing. Their sense of pessimism is so strong that they consider silence or suicide as the only possible way to free themselves. They want to escape from all the worldly relations and responsibilities, desires and defeats, values and vanities. Every moment seem burdensome to them. They feel this burden and get suppressed beneath it. The unfavorable and pressing situation forces them to end their lives untimely, unnaturally and that makes it a play for the theater of absurd. On reading the play, we realize that the, the zoo story is not a story from any zoo where the animals are caged and separated from each other by fencing or bars or walls, but in point of fact, it is about humans who are psychologically caged, isolated and disconnected. The zoo story has only two major characters, Peter and Jerry who are stuck in a web of pessimism. It is a single episode play that starts with an accidental meeting of two strangers, Peter and Jerry. Peter is in his early 40s, he has a wife and two daughters. Jerry is in his late thirties and is single. Once Jerry bumps into Peter in a central park and starts talking to him as if Peter is a familiar person. Peter does not understand why this stranger talks to him and so he tries to ignore him. However, Jerry unconcerned with Peter's cold response keeps telling him that he had been to zoo. Before Peter comprehends Jerry's self-claimed familiarity, Jerry changes the topic and drags Peter into conversation by saying that he seems to have lost the direction. Peter gets annoyed with all his irrelevant talks and tries to dismiss him. Nevertheless, Jerry continues being uh, over friendly and asks Peter about his family, work and pets. Peter finds Jerry interspersing in his personal life, but Jerry does not budge. He gives a long narration of his pigeon hole like apartment where he stays alone. He says that he lives without one wife, two daughters, two cats and two parakeets that Peter has. Jerry expands his narration by continuing a handful of things that he has in his possession like a few toilet articles, clothes, a hot plate that is an induction stove, a can opener, a knife, two forks, two spoons, three plates, a cup, a saucer, a drinking glass, two picture frames, both empty, eight or nine books, etc., etc. He also says that his parents are dead. His mother walked out of the house leaving his father and himself behind. He says that his family is nothing but a terribly middle European joke. Jerry also tells Peter about his queer identity. Jerry talks about a woman in his neighborhood who objectifies him for her sweaty lust. Peter tries to stop listening to all of Jerry's irrelevant talks, but Jerry starts another story with the title, The Story of Jerry and the Dog. He forcefully makes Peter listen to his fatal attempt to give rat po poison to this dog. The dog gets deathly ill. When the landlady asks Jerry to pray for the dog's recovery, he remembers his neighbors whose conditions are as pathetic as that of the dogs. 
the poison dog somehow survives and both Jerry, Jerry and the dog befriend each other. Peter gets hypnotized by this story. Jerry says, if you can't deal with people, you have to make a start somewhere with animals. Jerry says compromise is the key to all relations because compromise is a stage when we neither love nor hurt because we do not try to reach each other. This is how Jerry takes Peter on a philosophical flight but very immediately changes the topic by asking if he should sell the story to Reader's Digest and earn a couple of hundred bucks. Jerry's painful, humorous and relentless narration disturbs as well as bemuses Peter. He fails to connect the dots of Jerry's irrelevant stories. Jerry says he is a permanent transient. Jerry tickles Peter and diverts him from the spell that his stories have created. He asks Peter if he is interested in knowing about the zoo story that he mentioned at the beginning. Having noticed Peter's interest, Jerry fabricates a plot for another story with an act. He nudges and punches Peter to make some space on the bench so that he can sit. Jerry's punches and prodding get Peter annoyed and flustered. Jerry annoys Peter more with derogatory words and comments. He shapes up the situation as per his intention and provokes Peter to fight for the bench. While initially hesitant, Peter gets ready to fight as Jerry insults him for his meanness in claiming a bench in this central park. He is forced by Jerry to defend his claim to this bench. Peter gets en enraged with Jerry's continuous infuriating words and comments and for the first time opens up and says, I have come here for years. I have hours of great pleasure, great satisfaction right here and that is important to a man. I am a responsible person and I am a grown up. This is my bench and you have no right to take it away from me. Jerry finds himself successful in provoking Peter and just like Lady Macbeth challenges Peter's manhood and throws a knife at him to attack him with. Peter holds the knife and Jerry impels himself on the knife and thus gets murdered. Jerry's impeccable act of provocation almost blinds Peter to figure out his real intent. Peter is stunned at this unintended act of stabbing and Jerry on the other hand smiles with a sigh of relief. He tells Peter, I, I came unto you and you have comforted me, dear Peter. He also asks Peter to hurriedly disappear from this place to save being sighted. He says with a real concern, hurry away, your parakeets are making the dinner, the cats are setting the table. He closes his eyes and Peter, flabbergasted, keeps repeating, oh my God, oh my God. Jerry dies and Peter dashes off. So that is the storyline of the play. Now let us evaluate the play critically. LB's title is succinct. The article the in the title suggests that it is going to be some particular story, a story that has some reference to context. The collective noun zoo creates in our minds an image of the speechless, helpless animals who are separated by bars. The word story instills interest and excitement in the readers. This LB prepares us for the zoo story and Jerry prepares Peter for the zoo story but what we see is that LB and Jerry both do not tell us a story from the zoo. Rather they, the playwright LB and the character Jerry leave us to distinguish the human story from the zoo story. Jerry calls his apartment a kind of laughably small pigeon hole where the rooms are separated with beaver board. He calls a gay guy in his neighborhood as a colored quinn who wears a kimono and seeks attention from others. 
Jerry says he goes to the jo uh, to the John a lot. He never bothers me. LB doesn't capitalize J for John to show the colored queen's lustful relations with any random guy. Jerry also talks about a couple of Puerto Ricans who live in his neighborhood, but he is unaware of the number of kids that the couple has. Then he talks about how his mother left him and his father for her adulterous relationship with some Mr. Balikon. Immediately after this, Jerry tells Peter about his queer personality. He talks about one more woman in the apartment who always cries. And lastly, he tells Peter about the landlady and her black dog. The landlady has a sexual interest in him and the dog always snarls at him. Later, he poisons the dog but it survives and they befriend each other. We the readers, just like Peter, get entangled in Jerry's stories and fail to comprehend what exactly is going on in Jerry's mind. One after the other, he reveals very dramatically the dark truth about the disconnect among humans. Jerry is living a directionless life and so finds a good relief in making Peter his listener, his guinea pig. His loneliness is quite justified looking at his socio-economic condition. When we look at Peter's case, we are more astonished to find him in the same park with almost similar loneliness despite having an executive position with a publishing house with a yearly income of $200,000. He has a complete family, a wife, two daughters and two parakeets. Why is he not with family today or every Sunday afternoon? Peter is a sober and polite person who tries a lot to avoid Jerry and his disconnected and irresistible parables, observations and acts. It seems that the play begins in media race. Jerry at the beginning tells Peter that he has lost his directions. He talks about the geographical directions but later we see that it is the same about his life. LB doesn't highlight Peter's loneliness but leaves us to pour over the reasons why has he come all alone to this public park on a Sunday afternoon. And it's not just this Sunday. He says he comes to this park and sits on this bench every Sunday. Jerry's long speeches do not spare any chance for Peter to share his reasons for loneliness. Jerry's prolonged speeches keep the readers engaged and Peter entwined. Jerry uses humor to suppress his pain. He takes undue liberty and cracks some indecent jokes, but the undercurrent of his painful isolation is visibly st static. After being self-stabbed and finding Peter staggered, Jerry humorously claims the ownership of the hyped bench. His last supplicatory words, oh my god, are also uttered in the form of a scornful mimicry of Peter's yells and cries of the same words. Jerry's life ends with a question mark on the nation of America that later dreams with the civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. for the unalienable rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The zoo story is not about animals in any zoo, but about the human society that has lost faith and warmth and that finds solace either in isolation or in untimely death. Jerry's self-styled death reminds me of Willie Loman from Death of a Salesman who also hides his suicide under the act of a car accident. The zoo story is compact in size but is heavy as it voices the deep grown sense of pessimism in American society. Peter who has everything in the world doesn't speak. Jerry who has no one in the world speaks a lot. Nevertheless, they fail to communicate, share and feel any kind of friendliness. Yes, 
It is a play from the theatre of absurd school. With only two major characters and the same setting throughout, LB gives a wake up call to humanity at large. So, that is it for today. Bye for now.